So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Therese Sellers, author and educator, who will present her recently published book, Alpha is for Anthropos. Her work is an ancient Greek alphabet book with 24 nursery rhymes in ancient Greek that she composed over the course of 17 years in teaching ancient Greek to children. Um, I would like to open with a haiku that I wrote. And um, the haiku is inspired by the Greek Institute, and it can also serve as an invocation. One pine tree shelters this small blue house in Cambridge. Come, gentle muses. This is a place that I feel the muses will come to. And it's the Greek muses who will come here. And, and Maria and her husband have, have made this, this place for the muses. And here we are. Um, the next quote that I wanted to share is a quote by um, Maria's husband, Athan Anagnostopoulos, the founder of the Greek Institute. And I found this quote on their website or in their literature. Actually, I read it, and then when I went back and tried to find it again, I couldn't find it. But Maria confirmed that, yes, indeed, this, this quote did exist, and it was, it was by her husband, the founder. And this is the quote. The Greek language is Greece's greatest gift to the world. And I love that quote. I thought, what a claim. You know, we've got the country who gave us <laughs> democracy, you know, Greek tragedy, Homer, philosophy, those beautiful beaches in Kefalonia, <laughs> all those things. And, and we're going to say the best, the biggest gift to the world is the Greek language. And, and so, but I love that so much because the language is something that anyone can have access to. And it's flexible, it's available, it's portable. We have it here with us today when we're not in Greece at this moment. And, but it's more than that, it's that the language captures the inspiration of Greece. And that's, that's the real gift, it's this inspiration. But the, the language gives us the inspiration. So, so that's, and of course, I'm presenting a language book, an alphabet book, but I agree, the language, it is this kernel that, that if, we, if we start from that, we can begin to grasp this inspiration that is Greece. So um, I, I came to Greece through the language, and um, Rhea gave a little introduction, and I think one thing that I, that I left out is that before taking high school Greek, I went, I'm not of Greek descent, but I had the good fortune of going to a school in Philadelphia where they presented the Greek world to the fourth grade. And we spent the mm -hmm. entire fourth grade year learning about Greece. And it was so exciting to me. You know, I was a little fourth grader and I got to learn about the gods and the goddesses. I got to learn about the heroes. We even put on a Greek play. We put on Antigone. I was Antigone. <laughs> but, but this is where it gets really fun. Now you're going to laugh. There were three Antigones because it was a big part in this nice friend school. We wanted to make it fair. And so there was Antigone one, two, three. And we each had the same little purple chiton that we wore. And my mother said in the audience, like, you see one little Antigone run on stage. And then the, she'd run off in another little Antigone. But, but I was Antigone three. And I had to do, I had to walk into the tomb. You know, the, she gets buried alive. And I, I was nine years old, and I was going to make the audience cry. You know, I was in love with Greek drama, even whatever, when I was nine. So, um, so I guess I just want to say that 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 yeah, fourth grade, and then I studied. I did go on and study classics at Harvard, and at Harvard I also um, took modern Greek, and the whole new world opened up. The modern Greek poets, there, some of them right there. Um, and then that did lead to me actually going to Greece and, um, yes, getting a little tangled up in Greece and ending up buying property and building this <laughs> little village. So Greece did, and that's all just because, because of the Greek language. That's how it all started. Um, so I think we, we are going to get to the book, which is what we're really here to talk about, this, this book, which I can say beautiful because what made it beautiful wasn't me. It was the designer and the illustrator. I'm just the author. Um, so... 
uh, this book came about because um, I was teaching ancient Greek to children. So that's another story. Why was I teaching ancient Greek to children in the first place? Nobody teaches ancient Greek to children or not the little teeny children. So the way that came about was that I had come back from Greece. So I had been graduate school, Greece, various things happened. But then a certain thing happened, which is that I got married and I had little babies of my own. And I was in my house in in Gloucester actually not you know not in Greece and not really doing much except taking care of these children and a friend of mine who also had small children asked me to teach her son Greek and she this friend of mine is a very high powered person very ambitious and I sort of thought at first well oh come on you know <laughs> if you know your four year old doesn't have to learn ancient Greek you know and I, I know I, I actually kind of but I realized it's hard to explain but the joke was kind of on me you know it was through that child and through teaching him that I learned what an exceptionally wonderful activity ancient Greek is for a small child, if you approach it right. So this friend, I think also that she kind of felt sorry for me was at home, you know, with the babies all day long and missing my, my Greek and my Greece, and she gave me this opportunity. She said, I'm bringing my son to you for lessons. And it did. It gave me an incredible focus, and I started thinking, how do you teach Greek to a four-year-old? And I, I also, because I was a little bit rebellious, I was kind of like, well, I'm not going to, you know, sit him down with the dusty volumes. We're going to still have a happy, joyous childhood experience. And, and the mom remembers, and I guess I sort of remember to the very first lesson that I took him outside and I had, had a pomegranate. Mm -hmm. And I said, come here, come here with me. And there was a rock in our yard and I smashed the pomegranate. It was very exciting. You know, <laughs> smash. And then we opened it. We sat together on the rock and we ate the seeds. And I told him the story of Persephone mm -hmm. and we entered into the mythology. So with this little boy, it was all stories at first. And then gradually, it's like, well, I told him stories. It wouldn't hurt if I taught him a few Greek letters. So again, very tentatively, because I didn't want to be that overbearing person who's pushing Greek down the throat of a four-year-old, it was something like, well, let's draw, let's draw an alpha. So I had some chalk, and we had the little driveway, and we drew the alpha, which, of course, is a beautiful letter that looks like a fish. So we drew the alpha. We had little, you know, a whole little school of alphas. So, you know, still to say appropriate for a child. You know, this is keeping with him and his imagination. So, um, well, I guess I should, open the, I should open the book. You all, I think everyone here knows the Greek alphabet, but, but the Greek alphabet is beautiful. The letters are gorgeous. And in the very first um, page in our book is the whole alphabet. And we did it, the format of our book that we have the text here and the illustrations here, but we considered the alphabet to count as the first illustration. We put it in orange and we, we call it an illustration because these letters are so beautiful. So, um, you know, the, the Greek letters have names, alpha, you know, Lambda, uh, Sigma, you know, it's not just ABC, so even that was a whole other dimension for Alexander. Um, oh, actually, I have a joke. <laughs> I, read, I it was sort of just because I was talking about the Greek alphabet. Um, last year, on April 1st, I read an article by an Irish journalist who writes a lot about the EU and he, and a lot about the austerity about the crisis, and he had written that the EU had decided to take away the Greek alphabet, that there would be savings for, oh. you know, if signs were in English letter, and I was just, oh. I was incensed. I thought, you know, I'm not one of those people out on the street protesting, but now I'm going. I'm going to Greece, I'm going to join the protest. And, well, of course, it was an April Fool's joke. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really embarrassing. You know, I, I hadn't quite gotten out on the street yet, but I, I think I tweeted, you know, the philologists are going to come out on the streets. So, it was April Fools. So that was that was kind of embarrassing. All right. So we learned the Greek alphabet. This wonderful little boy, Alexander, and but then it, it started to be time to learn some words. Okay. So I know we're moving kind of slowly here, but now we're getting to a word. So I decided. Um, I'm not quite sure when I did this, but I think I started introducing words to him very early alphabetically. So I thought, okay, we're gonna have a word that begins with alpha. We're gonna start with a word that begins with alpha. And I chose the word anthropos. And an anthropos, of course, is a human being. So this is not apple. You know, it's not the easiest word in the whole Greek language. In fact, it's, it's complex, anthropos. But I just decided, well, 
you're going to learn one word right now. It, let's make it a really meaningful one. And I think that anthropos, it's, it's so central to, to Greek thought, the, the valuing of the human being and the centrality of the human being in, in Greek thought and in Greek art, and in Greek literature. Anthropos is at the center, and that's part of what makes the Greek so exciting, and, and the whole Greek world so exciting, is this importance of the anthropos, and what it means to be human, and a lot of consideration of that. So I felt, you know, it's an important word. And But again, for a child, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna lay a heavy trip on a four-year-old, um, so, but it was also that a child is learning their place in the world. And an anthropos, you know, a four-year-old is an anthropos. And, you know, and so is his infant little sister who used to come with the mom for the lesson. You know, and is she an anthropos? Yes, she's actually an anthropos too. And what is this thing to be an anthropos? It's to not be an Olympian god. And we learned about the Olympian gods. Of course, we learned lots of mythology with Alexander. It's not to be an animal. It's to be in this unique place in between the two. And that's something that even a small child can ponder and contemplate in an appropriate way at that age. So, so I felt that anthropos, you know, was a huge word. And for me, remember Antigone? Well, um, I don't remember the Coralodes from when I was in fourth grade, but when I read Sophocles later, um, and I even directed a student production once of, of Antigone um, in Greek at Barnard. That was a while back. That was a great job. Um, but the Ode to Man, there's, you know, there's a wonderful choral ode there that's all celebrating human potential. It's all about Anthropos. So that's what, when I taught Alexander Anthropos, I'm thinking of Sophocles, I'm thinking of other things, but I'm just telling him, you know, is, is your sister an Anthropos? You know, no. <laughs> yes. You know, is Athena an Anthropos? No. Is Zeus an Anthropos? No, they're gods. That's different. So we, we had a discussion about these things. Um, but now the next problem, how do you make him remember Anthropos? The little American child, Anthropos, you know, great, he could say it a few times, but the next week he's forgotten it. That's when my little nursery rhymes came in. I found out that if you take a Greek word, even the most difficult Greek word, and you put it to the tune of a familiar little child song, you've got it. It mm. sticks. Mm. So shamelessly, I started inventing little nursery rhymes, which I call them, in ancient Greek with one purpose when I start out. Make Alexander remember. Because he wouldn't remember. I say anthropos, we talked about all that, but the next week, what was that word? Forget it. He had no idea. So anthropos. So I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to drink a little soup of water because I'm going to sing. <laughs> Don't worry. It's, they're all very, very short. <laughs> so... Um, I put Anthropos to the tune of He's a Jolly Good Fellow, because whatever. <laughs> um, and I'm just, um, uh, well, here goes. Oh, Agathos is good. So I'm saying the man, you, most of you know agree, but the man is good. So you're getting another alpha word in there, Agathos. Oh, Anthropos Agathos, oh, Anthropos Agathos, oh, Anthropos Agathos, Agathos, oh, Anthropos. <laughs> Alexander, oh, oh. <laughs> um, thank you. So Alexander got Anthropos, you know, and he, you know, you actually get a lot more. You get the article, you get an adjective, you get mm -hmm. predicate and attributive position of adjectives, uh, Anthropos, well, Let's leave that for now. But, <laughs> but you get two ways. It's actually, they're both predicate. You get two ways of doing it. O anthropos agathos and agathos o anthropos. Mm -hmm. That was in our textbook when, <laughs> oh I have a high school classmate sitting right here. We were, we were in Greek together in Germantown Friends School and that little phrase was in our, it was actually in our textbook. Um, so, but I turned it to he's a jolly good fellow and that was how Alexander learned anthropos. Okay, so. I want to move forward a little more um, so we really talk more about the book. Um, the title of the book is Alpha is for Anthropos. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that this is a form for an alphabet book. Alpha is for Anthropos. A is for Apple. We had one. Um, a is for Annabelle. It was a beautiful book about a doll that I had when I was little. Um, but I guess I just wanted to say that there's a little more here than announcing an alphabet book. I am making a kind of uh, philosophical claim here, which is that alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet and anthropos means human being. So I'm actually saying with this title, I am saying being human comes first. 
prota nais anthropos. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, I think that the title, I want you to understand the title has that, that meaning too, and that when I teach Greek to children or to anyone, or when I study Greek, I always want to go back to the idea that we are studying Greek to study what it means to be human, and that that is, that is very central. It's not just because it's pretty. There is, there is more than that. Um, so the word anthropos in Greek mythology also has a great significance because anthropos is the answer to the riddle of the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. remember the Sphinx mm-hmm. used this beautiful, evil monster terrorizing Thebes, and if you can't solve my riddle, I will tear you apart, and you know, with my razor sharp claws and my teeth, I will, and so she's terrorizing Thebes, and she will not stop terrorizing until someone can answer her riddle. And her riddle is, what creature walks with four mm-hmm. legs in the morning? With mm-hmm. he, This creature walks on two legs in the middle of the day, and this creature walks with three legs at night. What is this creature? And so, you know, this is, again, a riddle that I, I was fascinated by that riddle when I first learned it as a kid. And I think, I still think it's a really good one, you know? Well, it's so cool. It's a person because they crawl when they're a baby, the morning of their life, and then walk on two legs in the middle of their life. And then in the evening of their life, the third leg is the king. Okay, so that's the three legs. That's temporary. That doesn't count. Um, <laughs> you're still on two legs. Um, so, but so, so you know, I told Alexander on the riddle of the Sphinx. I told him, you know, and now if you ever encounter a Sphinx and she is going to destroy you if you don't know the answer, there you know the answer. You say, yes, it's a person. It's a human being. I'm like Alexander. Who? Slow down. Sphinx doesn't speak English. Uh. You you have to answer the riddle in Greek. You know, how do you, and so then you get a little bit concerned, but of course, what is it? How do you say human being in Greek? <gasps> anthropos! <laughs> so if you know this word, anthropos, you can confront a sphinx. So we have, so now finally, we're looking at the pictures, because that's what's really fun about this book, is the pictures. Um, so, the pictures drawn by my sister, Lucy Bell, who also took Greek at Germantown Friends, who, who also became a classics major at Harvard, so, and who is an upper-level Latin and Greek teacher now in Philadelphia. And teaching my niece. Oh, and she's teaching. <laughs> we can't get away from this stuff. So, anyway, she's all also obviously a really good artist. So, we're going to draw, so we have the word anthropos. We have an alphabet book. You have a, a letter, A, alpha. You have a word, anthropos. Now we have to have a picture. So we didn't have a picture. Now it seems obvious. You have a picture of a girl confronting the Sphinx. But when we started, how are you going to depict anthropos? And I'm going to tell you, I was thinking of like Leonardo da Vinci with the, you know, man or something. No, that wasn't what we were going to do. But, but what, how do you depict anthropos? And we thought, well, it's going to be an illustration. So we're not to, well, yes, there is an anthropos, actually. There's a female anthropos right there. A female, not full-grown one. So it's a child, but it's an anthropos, right? She's human. And there's a monster, but then there's the word anthropos. So this picture isn't just a picture of an anthropos. It's a whole illustration of a story. And that's what the whole book is. You're going to find out that the pictures are, you know, if you think you're going to look you know, well, when you get to soul, we'll see what you get. But, but you're not, it's not just A is for apple and here's an apple. Every picture is an illustration, is a whole story. And so that's the beginning. That's Anthropos. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm going um, to go beyond this first picture. But I, again, just want to show you because I think we have to just stop and look at these pictures for a minute. Mm-hmm. Lucy Bell took a sabbatical from her job one year, unpaid. You don't get real sabbaticals when you're a high school teacher, but unpaid leave for one year. And she sat at her table for one year, hours, drawing these pictures. Mm -hmm. And each one of these pictures probably took between 40 and 80 hours, each single picture, all done with pencil and eraser. And then when she was done, she would ink them in. This is how she made this artwork. And, you know, I don't even know what to say. You know, just I couldn't even make that border. I couldn't draw that hat. And she looked at Greek vases a lot. Mm -hmm. And she studied the iconography of Greek vases. These are not copies of Greek vases. You're not going to find a little girl in a Greek vase. You will find sphinxes. 
you will find borders, you will find writing. So she is, in these illustrations, in fact, it's amazing. You're not just learning Greek with this book, you can learn vase painting. Uh -huh. You can learn the entire iconography of vase painting from Lucy Bell's illustrations because she studied and she put it in. Uh -huh. And there's much more in that that I don't even catch, but I do know that that, that hat is a traveler's cap. So this, in, in vase painting iconography, we know we have a traveler. And there is a famous phase, I think even in the MFA, of Oedipus confronting the Sphinx and he's wearing a traveler's cap. So she's make a little nod to that. But the little girl, she's active and she's pointing and the hat has swung off her head. So, you know, it's a very childlike, engaging interpretation of a vase. These are easier for children to engage with than the vases in the museum. But if a child grows up with this book or works with this book, they will then go to the museum and they will have a way in to that amazing artwork there through this book. So there's two languages you're learning here, Greek and this iconography of vase painting. Um, so I'm gonna move to a couple other pictures. I don't have time to um, <laughs> tell the whole book to you and you don't have time and we don't have time, but I'll do a few pages. You know, I'll just show a few pages. Um, the, you know, as I said, every, every page there's a world. Um, and, I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, there are notes in the back of the book mm -hmm. that help clue you in. So we know that not everyone who reads this book is a Greek scholar, you know? And, and so there's notes just helping you. So the riddle of the Sphinx. And we can't tell the whole story in a few lines of notes. We didn't have enough pages, but mm -hmm. enough keywords that you can search more. So it's like, this is the Sphinx. This is solved by Oedipus. Mm -hmm. And then you can go look it up in your myth book. And we encourage people to, and we hope people will. So. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, um, I, I guess what, as I said, we're, it's, let's see, it's already, um, it's already quarter of eight, and I've only shown you one picture. So I'm going to skip a little bit ahead to another word, just to give you an example of how Lucy Bell and I work together and take a word and hopefully go into a whole world of illusions. So, because I can't resist, I'm going to sneak on my way by, you're going to see a few pictures. That's um, life, and that's um, a boy in a rowboat. Um, my cousin saw this book, and she said, you're all, that's your son. That's your brother. That, she recognized all the people, because I guess, whatever. I, my sister, you know, she used some of family members for models. This is a gorgon running across a bridge. Yefira is the Greek word for bridge. This is, of course, London Bridge is Falling Down, the song. Oh, that was Row Your Boat. The uh, doron means gift in Greek. So, so the kids, you know, I'm like, okay, it's doron. What's what does doron mean? Horse? No. <laughs> doron means gift. Why is there a horse? Well, because one of the most famous gifts in Greek mythology was a horse, and then we can tell the whole story. And why is the little, the little child pulling his mother's hand? Um, so that's the horse, ego means I, and that was, how do you draw a picture of I, of me? What would you have drawn? I said, let's draw four different children, and it's about diversity, I. And no, that wasn't happening. Finally, this brilliant idea, you draw Narcissus. Mm -hmm. Ego, I, it's all about I. <laughs> and this is a symbol, what it is to be a narcissist, what it is to be alone, people all around, this woman's in love with him. There's winged Eros right there, but he doesn't see anything except his own reflection. He's, he may as well be on the moon, alone, ego. Um, oh, animals, children love animals. This is a Corinthian Olpe vase. My sister has studied vases so that the Corinthians used to make these vases with animals. So for my song about animals, she drew a vase with all these animals. And we ask, what does this animal say? And you can play with animal sounds. Children love that. The sun and rosy finger dawn. Mm. And you can, all my students know how to say rosy finger dawn because they know the song. <laughs> I mean, they've learned it to this song. This is the word, this is what I actually wanted mm. to focus on right now. Thalata. Okay, I'll show you the picture again, but if I show it to you too much, you won't listen to me. So <laughs> we have to withhold the picture for a minute. Thalata. Thita is for thalata. This is the Greek th. Thalata means the sea, thalassa in modern Greek. And the sea, of course, is incredibly important to the Greeks. It's a you know, seafaring nation, but it's also beautiful. And you look at it and you gaze at it, and 
there's a feeling of longing. Anyone here who has seen the Greek Sea knows what I'm talking about. You feel that longing. Greeks felt it, and anyone who ever goes to Greece feels it. And um, so there's something cool. So, but again, Thalatha, you know, Thalatha, well, when I used to teach this to students for years before I had this book, I, we would draw the meander and we'd, you know, draw a little sea, and that was about as good as it got. But I also would often tell them the story. Another, I just noticed another <laughs> classmate in the audience, hello. Um, um, th thalata. So there is, um, we had an idea of what to do. And I used to teach this too, that there is a sea goddess named Thetis. So her name also begins with Thita. So Thalata, Thetis. And I always used to tell this story when I taught the word thalatha. So this is the this is the illustration. So basically, what Lucy will did, and this is one of my absolute favorites, is that for thalatha, she drew a picture that illustrates a beautiful scene from the Iliad, and it's the scene that occurs in Book One of the Iliad, when Agamemnon dishonors Achilles, his best fighter. He he takes his, his slave woman away from him, who Achilles had been awarded. Huge dishonor. And when this happens, Achilles goes to the seashore and the noisy waves, and he cries and he weeps with rage and frustration and injustice. And this figure of this great hero on the beach crying from injustice, very powerful to me the first time I read the Iliad and remains very powerful. So what happens when Achilles goes down to the beach and he weeps? He cries to his mother. And his mother, Thetis, who is a sea goddess, remember his Achilles' his father is a mortal, but his mother is an immortal goddess and she's a sea goddess and she lives in the sea, Thetis. She emerges from the waves to comfort her son. And, you know, this is the Iliad. You know, if, if you haven't been to the Iliad recently, go back and read just book <laughs> one, because you will get a goddess coming out of the waves and comforting a crying soldier. And then, what does she do? This is what I love. This is what, you know, what any mother would do if her son was in trouble, and if she was a goddess. <laughs> she marches up to Mount Olympus, and she talks to, she, supplicate Zeus to intervene and help her son. And he does. And this is why, you know, when I saw the movie, they had a movie, Troy. I'm like, OK, fine, Troy, where are the goddesses? Well, I don't see somebody coming out of the waves. And you know, they had, they had a middle-aged woman playing Thetis. I'm like, well, first of all, if she's a goddess, there is no such thing as middle-aged. <laughs> they're all, they're youthful. What's, you know, so, so go read your Iliad. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so there it is. Thalatha. Sing it, oh, I yeah. shall. Yeah. I yeah. shall. Yeah. Don't worry. Um, this is Achilles crying. This is Thetis coming out of the waves. And I mean, I, I just love this picture. And, um, but she's a goddess, but I see this, we're talking about humanity again, I see a concerned mother. <laughs> you know, I see, oh, you know, she has, the, she has a child who's mortal. So she's a goddess, her son is gonna die someday, and she has the feelings for him that we have for, for our mortal children. Wow. And there, so there's, for me, there's a lot of intensity in that picture, and I adore it. And yes, I will sing. Okay, mm -hmm. so Thalatha, uh, you know, it's funny, I made notes for this talk, but I'm not wearing glasses, so I can't, <laughs> I can't really see what it says. But I can kind of guess. Uh, mm. All right, so this is, this is actually hard to sing, and, and I'm not like a super good singer, so be, be nice. Um, but it's to the tune of Edelweiss in um, wow. Sound of Music. Because it's sentimental, <clears throat> I wanted to capture the sentimentality that the Greeks feel towards the sea, that we all do. Um, and the words mean, see, see, when I look at you, see, see, deeply, I love you. So it goes like this. Thalata, thalata, epicetheore, o thalata, thalata, vatheosephile, o. I think if, if you give these little tunes, I can sing them to indicate the tune, but you give it to a child or an adult who has a very beautiful on-key voice, and they could be very, very beautiful. And I sing it to indicate 
how it's supposed to go, but then I'm hoping someone takes it from there. And I did, you know, we talked about the whole music thing, like in the back of the book, I say to the tune of, so you can go and it's all marked, but what if you don't know Edelweiss? So we actually did with my son's guitar teacher, I sang them all and we have recordings of all of them oh, wow. on the website. So if you go in the, fr you know, in the front of the book, it says www.scanius.org, that's my publisher. They have all the songs. And then I have them on my website. Alpha is for uh, www, alpha is for anthropos.org. Yes, I actually have such a website. Um, and I recorded all the songs and I actually recorded them both mm -hmm with the modern Greek pronunciation and I recorded them with what the Greeks call the Erasmian pronunciation which is more commonly how Americans pronounce Greek ancient Greek when they learn it but I have the the Greek the Greek recordings are in there too um, so yeah if you're wondering you can always go find um, you can find the recordings again not because I'm expecting that this is the best recording you ever heard but because it gives you an idea of how how the tune goes and then you take it from there um, all right, I guess I was thinking um, to show you Kore. Uh, Kore. Kore, there, speaking of pronunciation. Um, Kappa is for Kore, okay? So again, on the way by, we're gonna just sneak a few other pictures. Oh yes, because this is uh, Ipos, horse, mm -hmm. and this is just my sister. I said, can you draw a horse? You know, I can't draw, can you draw a horse? So, you know, the word means horse, I said draw a horse. Well, she gives me a winged horse. With with a hero astride killing a chimera. You know, I asked for a horse and I get Pegasus with Bellerophon <laughs> and the chimera. And it, for me, this is just, these were these virtuoso moments where I'm, you know, talking to her and she's at home at the drawing board. And she said, well, I, I thought, what do you think of this? And I would just look at it and say, are you kidding me? It's gorgeous. You know, she sent them to me in pencil. And is it okay? Do you think it's okay? It's like gorgeous. So that's the horse. Um, oh, yeah. So here we go. Kori, all right? So kappa is for kori. Now in modern Greek, kori has come to mean daughter. Um, in ancient Greek, it means a maiden. So a young, unmarried woman, not a child, not a grown up woman, but that sort of magical stage in between. Um, so this is a maiden, kori, and um, my song for, for, this, for this word. So when I taught the word kori, to, to my students, um, I told them a story about a very specific maiden. And there was this one, her name was Arachne. And she was exceptionally talented at weaving and spinning. And Lucy Bell's picture shows a girl with a drop spindle. This is a kind of um, traditional spinning that you see in traditional societies and the ancient Greek girls would have done this. And she's contemplating a spider. And the story, the, the story that I like to tell when I teach this word is about a girl named Arachne, who was exceptionally good at weaving, but she boasted that she was better at weaving than Athena. Mm. This is an act of hubris. And Athena punished her famously mm. by transforming her into spider. a spider. So she was the first arachnid. So, okay, because I'm silly and because it's for children, I made my little song about Arachne to the tune of Itsy Bitsy, 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 Bitsy Spider. <laughs> so I will sing it for you. So, um, but anyway, basically what it says is, if you don't altogether follow Greek, it says, the girl Arachne wove well. The girl Arachne made, made an act of hubris against Athena. That's saying you can weave better than the goddess. And then the goddess Thea the goddess Athena got really angry, and of the girl Arachne, she changed the form. Okay, that's what the so that's what my song says literally, but I will sing it, but then I don't say the word spider anywhere in the song, but the tune clues you in, okay? <laughs> okay, here goes. I kori Arachne i fene kalos, I kori tin Athenan, Ivri se Ithea Athena Male Fimothi Ketis Kori Sarachnis Alaxtin Morphin. So um, I had this, you know, I had so much fun. This was, you know, remember I was the stay at home mom, but I got to do my Greek with the kids. And of course, I had Alex at first, then other kids came and we had the whole little classes of kids learning Greek with these songs. And I had a lot of fun with them. 
But I had a whole different kind of fun years later when we were publishing the book. And I brought the manuscript with all these songs, these little nursery rhymes I had made up with lots of feeling of freedom for little children. There wasn't going to be a, a, a kid in the group who was saying, that's the wrong form of the aorist passive. <laughs> you know? So I could be, I was a little free and easy with my compositions. I mean, I mean, not to, let's be fair. I did, I looked things up in the dictionary. Like I'm, a, you know, I'm trained as a classicist, so I took it seriously. I didn't want mistakes. But when it came time to publishing this, you know, in print with all the accents, I, I have to admit, I went back to my Harvard professors, you know, 30 years after graduation, I went to Boylston Hall and I said, you know, <laughs> Professor you, this and Professor that, could you please look at my verses and make sure they're okay? And I just remember this professor, again, who I had respect and admired, but, you know, I was just an undergraduate from a distance. Then we met again 30 years later and it turned out, I was allowed to call him by his first name now. That was, I didn't even know he had a first name. <laughs> and so there we were sitting in his office and I'm presenting to him Itsy Bitsy Spider in ancient Greek. And, and he just, we were laughing, you know, the serious scholars. And how many times are they asked to, you know, copy edit a text in ancient Greek, composed by one of their former students. And it's all silly children's songs. So, you know, he, he when we got to this one, he was just like, where did you get this? You know, he said, did you find this text somewhere? I was like, I just like stumbled on a papyrus with <laughs> something to the tune of Itsy Bitsy Spider. And, but I was so, you know, I was like complimented that he kind of thought you couldn't just make this stuff up. But I was like, how else would you get this stuff? So that was, that was the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Um, I guess... Um, Let's see, I had thought about showing you Odos Road, which I will. And then we're, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, tie it up because I do want people to be able to also ask questions and stuff like that. And there I had some refreshments that we let, I think we ate most of them beforehand, but <laughs> we might have left a few. Um, so I'm just gonna, I can't resist on my way by. This is Achilles. There are a couple of Achilles pictures in here. This is a scene from the last book of the Iliad where where Achilles shows hospitality to mm -hmm. the king of the Trojans. Exceptional, extraordinary. We depict the hospitality by the act of untying sandals. In the Iliad, Achilles did not actually untie Priam's sandals, but he did show him hospitality. So that's this. This is another Kore, Kori. This is um, Persephone. The word is mother. And so the word is mother. We drew a girl because Demeter is the most important mother in Greek mythology. Well, I'm being, she's a very important mother. And her daughter, Persephone, is a very important Kore. In fact, the word Kore, sometimes they don't even call her Persephone. They just call her Kore, daughter, girl, maiden. She's the quintessential maiden. And this is this, uh, pr prior to her abduction by Hades into the underworld. Um, the ship with the three little mice. This is a lot of people, this is their favorite yeah. picture. Three blind mice, mikra naf, mikra naf, puplis, puplis, xifos, odos. This is one of my favorite pictures. And I don't know, when you look through the book, people have their favorites. And I don't know why this is my favorite. I think it's the little stones. Odos means a road or a way. And there's just something about those little stones on the road and the, the torch. and. Um, there's a road in, in Athens, this actually still exists today, called the Sacred Way, mm -hmm. Iera, Iera Odos. Mm -hmm. And so one of my associations for this word, Odos, it just means a road, but I was thinking of this very important road in, in Athens. And the reason it was important is because it was the route of an annual procession from Al Athens to Eleusis, which is where they performed the Eleusinian Mysteries, which are these religious rites in honor of Demeter. And they were mysteries. And you would only really know what they did there if you were one of the initiates. And so, you know, even the scholars of this don't really know exactly what happened at these mysteries. But one thing that happened was a procession on, on, a, on this sacred road that was called the Sacred Era Odos. And um, this picture is imagining, this is, not, this is not the mysteries. This is just imagining a boy walking down the road, but the boy is thinking about the mysteries. This is not a grown up. This is a, a young boy. Mm -hmm. He's got the traveling cap. He's holding a torch and he's thinking about the mystery. So I was going to sing that song for you, and then I think I should, I should conclude. So um, let's see. 
sur le pont d'Avignon. <laughs> okay, so it says, the, the sacred way, there go the initiates. The sacred way lead towards the mysteries. Io dos iera equi pore fonde i miste. Io dos iera feri prosta mystica. Um, I'm going to just page you through because the last page I want to show you is the last page of the book. Pavian is, uh, Pe is child and she has 13 little children. This is a counting song. This is Ring Around a Rosy. Um, Rodon means rose. The song is Ring Around a Rosy. The satyrs are knocking over a vase with a rose. And as if that wasn't clever enough, she has a menad because traditionally in Greek vases, satyrs are chasing menads. So this is, uh, she's flipped it into a different form of a new way to annoy menads. <laughs> play Ring Around a Rosy. So very innocent and playful, but naughty. And they're knocking over a vase. Sophia, wisdom. We have a whole reflection on what it means to be wise. Tetix, cicada. Um, this is sleep. Hypnos, the mythology of, of Hermes trying to get Argos to fall asleep. This is a huge, beautiful story from Greek mythology. Friends. That's, that's my sister and her best friend from, from uh, lower school. And uh, yes, Kere. Uh, Greetings. This is um, Achilles with his teacher, who was a uh, centaur. Um, the soul, represented by a butterfly, and there's a soldier with the butterfly. Ipsihi. Athanatos ipsihi. The soul is immortal. This is one of the most poignant pictures in the whole book. The soul is immortal, and we show a soldier who is probably going to die. And if he's not going to die, he has known people who have died. So he's contemplating mortality, and there's a soul, a butterfly, and poppies. Um, so, the last, this is where I wanted to end, omega is the last letter in the, in the Greek alphabet, and um, there are not a lot of Greek words actually that begin with omega, and so when I was trying to think of an omega, I had a little trouble, and I had already introduced Okanos in another song, so what I did for our omega was simply, I hope you buy this, but it's just the <laughs> single word O. O, the omega, which you put in front of a name when you make an invocation or when you address somebody. Mm -hmm. So one of my students was happy we finally got Zeus into the book. <laughs> this page has O, Zeph. We're supplicating, we're addressing Zeus in this page. So um, you also can address muses. O, Musa. Remember we began at the very beginning, I said come gentle muses. So the invocation, invocations to gods, muses, Zeus, whoever, O, begins with O. So O, so we have um, the picture is a child. And if you, when you look carefully, he has a little scroll. And the scroll has three words from the first line of the Odyssey, part of the invocation to the muse. And so the child has written an invocation. And then poof, a muse! <laughs> so a muse has appeared. So this picture depicts a child with his scroll and a beautiful goddess, which is a muse who has come, maybe surprised him, but somehow he supplicated. And the song, the, the words that I have, to the tune of, oh dear, what can the matter be? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh Zeus, the book is ending. And this will be the end of my talk. So it goes like this. O Zeph, te left to vivlion. O Zeph, te left to vivlion. O Zeph, te left to vivlion. I logo, I logi de zosinai. But words live forever. The book ends, but words, but words live forever. So. Thank you. Um, I would be delighted to answer questions. Thank you for all your patience listening to me talk. I think I, I talked longer than I said, but I would be absolutely delighted to answer any kind of questions that any of you might have about the book or anything else. Yes. I'm sorry. Re repeat your question. Yes. What a beautiful question. Did the little boy Alexander become a classicist? 
the little boy Alexander. Okay, I, I'm so proud to talk about Alexander, and I'm so happy that you that you asked. He's actually my godson. His his mom is a, an old time friend of mine, and he's my godson. He did not become a classicist. He he's in college now, and he but he's studying language, and his mother he. After Greek, the Greek he did with me over the years, he stopped in high school, I think. I think he, he, he went to boarding school. So that was when we stopped. And then he studied Spanish and he studied Japanese. And his mother says that it was the, she's very kind. And she says that, the, you know, the Greek helped him view himself as a language person, as a linguist. But, you know, he's a little embarrassed that he didn't continue with Greek. And, um, and I actually wanted him to, I wanted him to come here tonight. He's on vacation. They're all in... Bahamas, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> but we have the Greek language. <laughs> but anyway, um, so no, he did not become a classic. But other students, you know, Christopher, it's one of my students, he's now a junior in high school, but he started in third grade. He actually wrote, I asked him, I said, would you write one of the testimonials? He's 15, he was 15 years old. So Christopher definitely will become a classicist. And he started in third grade with me. So, so yeah, it can happen, but no, they're, they're kids who have come through. My children both learned all these little songs when they were little, and they, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe modern Greek, but not classic, classical Greek. No, they're not interested, really. So I expose, you know, you, what do you say? You expose things to people, you share your passion, and then people choose. You put it out there. This isn't really a question, but I just finished t uh, taking ukulele lessons, yeah. <laughs> and I thought because I have a hard time with instruments, and uh, and so I wanted something really you know easy to play. And so I was just thinking I could with those tunes I could play the ukulele and learn at <laughs> the same time. I'm gonna so I'm gonna repeat your comment because I know that it it probably won't get recorded oh, okay. if I don't repeat it. But uh, if I understand that there's there's this idea that the ukulele, and I'm gonna copy this idea okay. that if you're not a, a super accomplished musician the ukulele actually is an instrument that is simple enough that maybe you could learn enough to accompany some of these simple tunes yeah it has a nice tune too mm -hmm. good good tip good tip yes constance so i never took greek but i took four years of latin and another year in college and i worry that now people aren't studying Greek and Latin mm. unless they're lucky enough to have you as a teacher. Uh, what can we do as, as people who love these languages to try and keep them alive in the schools and hopefully reach students who are young enough to get excited? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a, that's a big question, and I know that it's a question that is close to Maria's heart, especially who Maria, our <laughs> host, is here, um, as, as, as pertains to the Greek. And the Latin, I mean, look, my understanding is that Latin in schools, I was a, I was a middle school Latin teacher for a while, and, and my understanding is that, that Latin's getting younger. So strangely enough, there's less Latin than there used to be in high schools, but that actually nowadays mm -hmm. there's more Latin in middle the schools. Middle school. mm -hmm. And so the question, what can you do to promote Latin studies? Well, I have a great answer for you, which is my publisher, which is uh, a nonprofit organization called Ascanius, their mission, the mission of Ascanius is to promote classical studies starting as young as possible. So you could maybe be in contact with them and they'll tell you how to help. So there, there is an organization out there that is promoting this and that might be, as far as Greek, I mean, you know, that's, that's Maria, you know, here at the, here at the Greek Institute, but I don't, I guess, Constance, I don't really have an answer for you. You know, I feel like I I go in there and I teach Greek because I think it's exciting and fun. But how do you you know do something bigger like make make it catch on, make lots of people want us to? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer. Well, Tracy, yes, I mean, Caroline. I I mean I'm not planted, but it seems to me that they could do would be buy your book and give it to all your grandchildren yeah. and your nieces. <laughs> and your nieces and your nieces. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sure we, <laughs> the question was, how do you promote the study of, of Greek among children and young people if you don't have me present? And the answer is, you take my book. Because my book put out in the world everything that I have in my heart about how to teach Greek. And, it's, and the idea is, and I think this is important, and thank you, Caroline, but that my idea of how you teach Greek is that you don't get stuck with 
We're going to teach them anthrope because that's an English root. Yeah. Well, yeah. who cares? Yeah. It's it's much more than that. Let's give them the whole world. Let's not give them, oh, anthrope, a Greek word. You can get a good score on the SATs. Well, I don't care about that. I care that you can, you can confront a sphinx with the word anthropos. Mm. And that's where, where it matters. So I would say if you want to make it exciting, present it in its, in its meaningful, inspirational, cultural context. Don't strip it of that. And this book, I think you will find we keep the beauty and we keep the inspiration of Greek while teaching you the words. And um, Therese, I wanted to add to your question. I think there's a real opportunity to um, position this as the, the sort of half of classical um, training that's missing. So I agree with you. Um, you know, we live in the suburbs, and both our kids took Latin in middle school for four years, um, actually one of them into high school. But um, I certainly felt as a Latin student, I was always missing that other half. I mean, you learn about the Greek influence on the Romans, but you never actually are able to get the whole story because you're not learning right. Greek at the same so, time. So what a wonderful, this is a wonderful comment. Um, entry point. That Greek, that Greek, you know, in the old days, classics, Latin and Greek. Yeah. And then suddenly... What happened to Greek? Yeah. Why are they just studying Latin now? What happened to Greek? And and if you're just going to study one, come on, guys. Yeah, you know, yeah. study the one that the Romans studied. Mm -hmm. The Romans wouldn't, they wouldn't consider their children educated if they didn't teach them Greek. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go learn Latin and call ourselves educated? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I agree. Greek mm -hmm. is, it is missing. And why? Because people think it's hard. And that's why, mm -hmm. you know, that's why, again, you know, I'm like, Greek is not hard, you know, I can teach Greek to a four-year-old and in a meaningful way, you know, that it's not, you know, that he, he might not know all the grammar right now, but he knows what matters, the, the words and the associations and the, the cultural context. Mm -hmm. Yes. You've chosen two powerful things, the nursery rhymes and the myths, because mm -hmm. my children have just been glued to those Greek myths, Roman myths, mm -hmm. and also the Bible. The Bible stories are the most riveting and you can see that with the Percy Jackson series because everyone loves those Percy Jackson. So I think this is gonna so stories. You know, stories, stories are are powerful, and the Greeks have th these mythological stories, and that is yes, that's how it began. You know, start with the stories, and then I, and the, yes, the children. This is it is a selling point. Children love mythology, so I say, okay, well, you love Zeus and Hera. Don't you want to know the language they spoke to each other in? <laughs> Don't you want to know how to write their names with the real letters? You know, why do you want to write Zeus with English letters? Let's write it with Greek letters. Mm -hmm. And they do, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. there's this powerful thing and then the language gives you a deeper way into it. And, and yes, just um, because I saw your website, I checked it out. I think people might be, might be interested to know that you also have a coloring book. And a teacher's. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you, Rhea. Okay, I actually, <laughs> I never go anywhere without. Yes. My, the first time I went somewhere without my book, it was like leaving my newborn with a babysitter for the first time. <laughs> I know, just always have it with me. So, yes, um, this was actually a, a thank you very much, Rhea. This is um, really important right from the start was the idea that this is a very you know fancy book it's stitched it's smith sewn it has like mm -hmm. it has a gold st I mean, we yeah. cloth cover yeah. gold stamp i mean we wanted this book to be beautiful at the same time we wanted something that we could put in the hands of a little child so we printed it also in paperback it's exactly the same book the same texts the same pictures everything the same except it's in paperback it's stapled and it's a coloring book. And the idea is that you buy this for your kid and you let them really interact with the picture. And I've used this with really small children. And they're, well, they'll just scribble across it. Who cares? It's a coloring book. But they're looking at the pictures and they're making it theirs and you could make notes. So we had the idea, you know, we don't know where this is all going. I taught without the book for so many years and then we made the book and I haven't been teaching as much actually recently. I've been going around talking about the book. but. <laughs> When I'm with kids, I want them to hands on. I want them. So I think there was this idea that the teacher would have this or the parent and that the child would have this and that the parent would share this with a small child. But when you want to leave the child and say, here, you would maybe give them this one. Um, and and then I wrote this comprehensive teacher's guide. And this was kind of funny because I spent the whole summer 
before publication worried about the Greek, the accents, the text, and all this. And I almost forgot to write the teacher's guide, which I had promised. And it was, you know, it's really long. It was like, it was like 40 pages. Like, oh, whoops, I have to go write. For I, in very great detail, explain how I teach from this book. I describe what lessons. I, I do craft projects with the kids. Every single letter in the alphabet has a craft project, and I describe it in this you know, we make wings for sandals mm -hmm. so we can fly. We make, you know, Greek vase. I have lots of little projects and activities, and they're all in here. So if you're actually, you know, going to try and bring Greece, in, yeah, it's all there. It's there's a way to do it. My whole method, everything I've done, I've put out there for people to do. And and I know, you know, I do know a few people have written to me. Oh, I, you know, I tried this with this group of kids, and it worked, and that's really gratifying. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's all out there. So the coloring book, and these are available. Um, the These books, I mean, we're selling afterwards. Maria will sell anyone who wants. Of course, I'd sign with great pleasure. Um, they're also in local bookstores, like the Harvard Bookstore and the Schoenhoffs, and the Grolier has these. The, I think Grolier has the coloring books, but it's all available on Amazon. Okay. And it also is all available at the publisher. And the, the publisher will send them to you for free shipping. So you can get, I think, um, you know, you can get a bunch of coloring books and you won't have to pay shipping if you get them from, if you want more than, you can get them, I think, at Grolier, but if you want to get like a bunch, I would go to the, straight to the publisher and they won't charge you for shipping. So, so yeah, that's the, this is the whole, you know, there's a lot here. And there are the songs on the website and then there's this whole teach, this whole teacher's guide, which, you know, I'll go into a little more depth about the mythology um, and tricks. You know, how do you get a kid to understand that a C is an X and I have some little, tri you know, I have a lot of silly stuff developed over the years that I share as much as I possibly can so that if anyone wants to do this, you know, I'll tell you everything I know and, yeah. I was just thinking towards that, could it, it almost be an after school club at some schools because, you know, they're so mm -hmm. brought with, a, you know, they have to do so much during the day, that would make a really great after school club. Yeah, and it's, program. and that was how, I mean, that was how I began oh, when yeah. I first, because I did it in my house when my children were small and then I went to their school. When my kids got older, they started going to school and I said, oh, do you want me to do after school Greek? And and, and they said, yes, and I came in, but it, it so happened, they said, do you know Latin, too? And I'm like, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> why? <laughs> and they said, well, our Latin teacher's retiring, and we're, we need a replacement. So I ended up becoming a full-time Latin teacher, but I still did the Greek after school. Oh, and, and I finally left the school so I could have time to develop the curriculum, because the Latin was eating me up. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a point when the kids were so overbooked that they couldn't come after school, because they all had activities. And guess what we did? We had a class called Sunrise Greek. And we met before school. Oh my God. And I had 12 little kids that would come. And it was sunrise. And they would come. And you know, literally, what in the middle of winter, there were days I saw the sunrise over the school as I'm driving in at like 7.30. And we're, why am I here? But then we'd get in, and the kids would be like singing Ring Around a Rosie in Greek and dancing around. Because I always let them be silly. I'm like, if it's not fun, I've lost them. So hold it. Play Ring Around a Rosie, knock over a vase, you know, <laughs> have a ball. So Sunrise Greek was huge. And when I left the school, the kids were sad, you know, for the Aww. Greek, the Greek kids. Mm -hmm. And they're all in here. I dedicated all I the kids it. I taught Greek. Every kid I, I oh gosh, it was so scary if I would forget one. But I <laughs> tried to go through every kid had ever been in one of my Greek classes. And Alexander, of course, was the first. But then all the kids that I ever taught, I put their names oh, in the dedication. Um, because they inspired me and they, you know, when I started collecting the rhymes, it's like, oh, I don't have a rhyme for the letter sigma. I got to, got to, you know, I had to, I'd be driving down to teach thinking, what am I going to sing them today? So they inspired, they inspired the songs.